A very warm welcome to you all this evening. Thank you for joining us uh, for this evening service from Stornoway Free Church. Now, I have a number of intimations, firstly to read out uh, for the benefit of the congregation itself. Uh, so I'll go through these first of all before we begin the worship. First has to do with a congregational meeting and it runs as follows. The Kirk Session has called a congregational meeting to take place by Zoom on Monday 29th of March at 7.30pm. The purpose of the meeting is to examine and approve a sustentation schedule relating to the renewal of the post of Assistant Minister in the congregation. This is required whenever an Assistant retires or accepts a call to another congregation. The schedule will accompany a petition to the General Assembly requesting the renewal of the post. It is important that there be sufficient attendance at the meeting to make approval of the schedule realistic so your cooperation in this will be much appreciated. If you already join the Wednesday evening Zoom meetings, Zoom login details will be emailed to you. Otherwise, please contact Marianne for this. A sustentation schedule, sustentation fund schedule, basically a document that sets out certain statistics relevant to the congregation, number of households, number of communicants, number of uh, people attending church and so on, as well as financial statistics um, over the past three years. And this is required by the church in order to agree to what we hope and expect to agree to uh, renew the post of assistant minister so that we can then replace um, the present assistant once he retires in uh, August. The joint statement uh, is as follows. It's been issued already. I can read through it. Uh, the Kirk Sessions of Stornoway Free Church and Stornoway High Free Church are pleased to announce that an arrangement has been made approved by the Kirk Session and Deacon's Court of each congregation, whereby the seminary building on Francis Street can be used by both congregations for services on the Lord's Day. Details of the services will be announced in due course by each Kirk Session to their own congregation. All services will be fully compliant with COVID-19 regulations, as long as these are required by the Scottish Government. Both Kirk Sessions sincerely pray that this arrangement will contribute to further gospel blessing in Stornoway, and beyond. And I wish to add to that for our own congregation, uh, the High Free will do a similar thing at, in due course for their own um, services. Uh, it's really setting out a kind of roadmap for where we uh, would like to have the services proceed in these weeks and months to come. Initially, uh, providing Scottish Government COVID regulations allow, we, the Stornoway Free Church, will hold an English service at 11 a.m. on Sunday the 4th of April at 2021 and that is a, a, a significant day in that it is Easter Sunday and we usually focus on the resurrection of Jesus so it's very appropriate uh, that we uh, actually seek to open on that day. So that's 11 a.m. 4th April that'll be in the seminary and this will be the pattern for a number of weeks with a recorded or live stream service for the evening service during these weeks. That will be at 6.30. The High Free congregation will have the use of the seminary for an English service at 6.30pm uh, whenever they decide to begin services. That's the first step in the roadmap. And then secondly, the second step, hopefully by the end of April, um, both congregations, our own and uh, the Stornoway High uh, Free Church, will share a Gaelic service at 11 a.m. in the seminary and at the same time we the Stornoway Free Church will have our English service in the Kenneth Street Church. That's our aim uh, as soon as possible and hopefully around about the end of April and the High Free Church service will then be at 6.30 in the seminary. So that way there'll be a combined Gaelic service at 11.30 in the seminary at the same time as we will have an English service in the uh, church at Kenneth Street and the High Free will have their English service in the seminary at 6.30. These are all uh, the plans at the moment and uh, we will hopefully be able to widen that out at a future date to have for ourselves an evening service as well. But we need to just leave it at that for the moment. So please just uh, pray that uh, these arrangements will indeed be facilitated, that there'll be nothing further in the way of our beginning these services together. Uh, and also uh, have each congregation be able to meet physically as a gathered service in the way that I've set out there. These are the details of the agreement anyway that's been reached and thank God for that and thank God that we are able to together face the difficulties that we have at this time in God's providence 
and look to the future positively with our trust in the Lord. So now we're going to begin our worship and tonight we're singing firstly in Psalm 107, that's in the Scottish Psalter, Psalm 107, and that's on page 382, we'll sing verses 1 to 7, Junus and Lawrence, praise God for he is good for still his mercies lasting be. Verses 1 to 7 of Psalm 107. Praise God, for he is good, for still his mercies lasting be. Let God's redeem say so, whom he from the enemy's hand did free. And gather them out of the lands from north, south, east, and west. They strayed in deserts, pathless way, no city found to rest. Or Hungered in them fiends, their soul when streets them press. They cry unto the Lord, and he them frees from their distress. Them also. That right is he did guide, that they might to a city go, wherein they might abide. Uh, let's read now from God's Word from the Gospel of Mark and chapter 5. <clears throat> the Gospel of Mark, chapter 5, beginning at verse 21. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for twelve years, who had suffered much under many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was no better but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus, and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house some who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they all laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. 
Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumi, which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was twelve years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this, and told them to give her something to eat. Amen. And as always, we pray that God will follow with his blessing this reading of his word. Let's join now together in prayer. Let's call upon the Lord. Lord, our gracious God, our God and our King, as we come before you tonight to bow in worship, to express our praise in song and in words, and to seek your blessing in prayer, we give thanks, O Lord, that we are able to do so, conscious that you are the same one of whom we have been reading, the one whose power has not in any way been diminished, the one whose concern for us in our plight as sinners has not been reduced, the one who rules sovereignly over all things, the one who has revealed himself to us in Jesus Christ, the one who has spoken of throughout your word, this word of scripture, in a way that has been so blessed to many generations down through history. Lord, we are privileged that we are given such a view of your word, uh, such uh, an opinion of uh, what it is and who it has come from, so that we can come before you tonight, uh, looking to the guidance of your word and the impact of your word in our souls. We thank you that your word, as you use it, is still powerful, and that even as you said to this little girl so long ago, Talitha Kumi, with such instant results, so you are still speaking into the hearts and lives and situations of human beings such as we are. And you are the one who is able to change us inwardly so that our life takes on a new dimension, so that we are brought from death to life, so that we are given the hope of eternal life, which we did not possess until that change came. We thank you, Lord, that you are the master of that change as of everything else. For in some cases we know that you come suddenly and quickly into the experience of people who have perhaps never known or heard of you before. And we thank you that in other cases you come as gently as the morning, so that the dawn of spiritual life comes almost imperceptibly into their experience. And we bless you, O Lord, that when the light does come, you give us in that knowledge of God in the face of Jesus Christ. You give us to know of that hope which takes us forward and looks into your promises and realises the certainty with which we can hold them. For you are faithful to your promises and you are truth itself. O oh Lord, bless us. We pray as we come together in this way tonight. And as we thank you for the way that you have been to us during these months and over the past year. We thank you for your faithfulness, uh, for the way that you have continued to encourage us despite the setbacks that we have from time to time received. And we thank you for your upholding of us, for your strengthening of us, for your, your guidance to us through your word. We thank you for those who have come to know you as their saviour over this time. We give thanks that you have strengthened your people in many cases that you have brought them renewed conviction that you are God. We thank you for your mastery of providence as well as of your word. We pray tonight, O Lord, that you would bless once again this word to us. We pray as we see an opening beginning of restrictions being lifted and of us uh, having the prospect of returning once again to our church buildings uh, to share together in that way in gathered worship. Lord our God, we thank you for that prospect. We pray for its fruition. We pray that you would give us the wisdom to work towards it in a sensible way. We pray, Lord, that you would continue to bless us as a nation, despite all that you see we are in our ungodliness, in our resistance to your will and to your word, in our acceptance of so many other forms of belief, and the philosophies of human beings. Forgive us, Lord, for these, we pray, 
and forgive us when it is obvious at least in some cases that this time of crisis has not changed human hearts. We ask nevertheless, O Lord, that you would make us thankful that we have come through this to such an extent. We pray for those who have lost loved ones on the way, for those who are still seriously ill through COVID and whose prospects of recovery are long-term. We thank you for those who have recovered quickly. And we pray, Lord, that you would continue to enable us to know days ahead uh, when the impact of the virus will be increasingly reduced. We thank you to that end for the vaccines that are now available. We pray, O oh Lord, that we may be thankful to you. And as we have been singing tonight of your goodness, so, Lord, we do give thanks that in your goodness you continue to remember us, and that out of your goodness flow the blessings that we so richly enjoy. Bless us, we pray, as a congregation of your people, as we anticipate uh, these uh, changes in the future, to enable us to come to meet together as we once did. Remember us too, Lord, in the arrangements that we make with the High Free and bless them as a congregation. Help us to work together towards the greater good of your cause. Enable us, Lord, to wait upon you and to seek your blessing in every step of the way that we would seek to go forward. And we ask, O oh Lord, that your blessing will extend through all our congregations in the presbytery here and beyond. And enable, we pray, all of us to look forward to the day when we can once again more openly evangelise and reach out with the gospel into our communities. Lord our God, bless, we pray tonight, our families, our loved ones, our children and grandchildren. Bless us in our homes, bless us in our places of work, wherever we are able to go to work or whether we're working from home. Bless too, Lord, those who are on furlough at this time and may be anxious over return. Bless those who, whose work uh, has ceased and how, who have now come to be unemployed. Lord, grant your blessing to them. Uh, grant that you would enable us to recover as a nation economically and help uh, those who are in charge of, of our land in Scotland and the other parts of the UK. Lord our God, we commit them to you and ask amongst the, the turmoil that uh, we know is so often the case politically as well as in your providence. Grant us, Lord, in your great mercy that you would look upon us in your favour. So receive us now, Lord, as we offer our thanks to you and continue to bless us and hear our prayer and pardon us for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, children, we're looking once again tonight at words in the book of Psalms that tell us about Jesus, or words that we know are taken by the New Testament and applied to Jesus. And I'm looking tonight at Psalm 118, Psalm 118 at verse 22, which says the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvellous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Now that verse is quoted. There's a similar verse in Isaiah, uh, chapter, 60, uh, chapter 28, verse 16. Uh, and then it's quoted in the New Testament in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20, and also in Second Peter, uh, sorry, First Peter, chapter 2, the second chapter of First Peter, and verse 11. So you can see from that that uh, the New Testament took this verse, these verses, to be specifically about Jesus, a prophecy about him. Now, I don't do much by way of Lego nowadays, but when the children were younger, I used to do some Lego. I still do it with the grandchildren as well. I love Lego. It's a great pastime. And I'm going to try and illustrate what a cornerstone is by just taking a few bits of Lego. And I hope they don't fall apart as I'm actually doing this. If you look at the red block here, it's on a slightly a blue base there, but if you look at the red block, it's, as you can see, it's in the corner. It's, you can say, the cornerstone. And the cornerstone in a building like the temple in the Old Testament was placed like this red one in such a way that you could then place, if it was placed properly with uh, being level and facing in the right directions and the sides of it were properly cut, you could then put stones beside it and the line would be straight in that direction and in that direction. So the building in many ways was set right by the cornerstone, first of all, being right. If the cornerstone was right and the other stones were laid properly beside it, 
you could be sure that the lines of the building went in the right direction. It was part of the foundation of the building. And from that, the building was, top, was placed on top of it and along from it and up on, it, up, on it, up on top of it as well. There's the cornerstone. It was fixed so as to really uh, determine which way the rest of the building could be built. And Jesus, as the cornerstone, is our foundation stone, first of all. You can build your life upon Jesus safely because if you build your life on Jesus by trusting in him, by giving your life to him, your life will then go in the right direction that pleases God, that will bring you ultimately, eventually to heaven. And you remember yourselves in uh, the Gospel of Matthew and chapter 7, there's the well-known story. You might have a, a chorus, in fact, about it. I'm sure you've heard a chorus about it. Maybe you've done it in Sunday school as well. Uh, the wise man built his house upon the rock and the foolish man built his house upon the sand. That's all to do with building on a right foundation and on a wrong foundation. If you want a building to last and not to topple over and not to be blown over by the wind, you have to fix it to a solid foundation in the ground. And if you build on sand like this man did, the rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and the house fell. So that's the story that Jesus told about uh, building on himself, building on a proper foundation. But when you take the cornerstone, it's not just building on top of it, but like we said, it's building beside it in, dif in the different directions that you can go from that cornerstone. In other words, when you have Jesus as your saviour, he keeps your life straight as long as we remain obedient to him and follow his word. Now, when you set a journey on a car sat-nav, or I remember one time some years ago being taken up to the uh, on the ferry to where uh, the ferry was controlled from, uh, up on the bridge as it's called, and the computer there that the captain or whoever is in charge of the ferry at the time, he, before they set off, he sets the course on the computer and you can see that line on the computer screen that they want the ship to follow. And that's then set, it's programmed, and as soon as it's programmed, that ship will keep to that particular course in that direction exactly as it's been set. And for us, as, as Jesus is our cornerstone, Jesus keeps our journey straight and true. The moment we actually go away from Jesus or start trusting in someone else or stop being obedient to Jesus, our life takes a wrong direction. We're straying from the path that's true and right. And uh, that's why the likes of Psalm 23, as you well know, is a psalm that uh, talks about God as the shepherd restoring our soul. But in addition to that, he leads you in the paths of righteousness. He steers the course for you in life when you give your life to him. So when you follow Jesus, your life will be going in the right direction. You'll be building on a foundation that's safe. When he is your cornerstone, it doesn't really matter then what happens in life, what other people think, what people may do to you. This is the most important thing. At the foundation of your life, everything is well. And when everything is well there, then ultimately, at the end of your journey through life, you will be with Jesus in heaven. Nothing can stop you or prevent you being in heaven when you have Jesus as your corner stone. So I hope tonight that you know Jesus yourself, yourselves, and that you know him as your cornerstone, and that in obedience to him, lovingly, you will allow him to steer your life in the right direction, and you can build your life upon him safely, so as to get to heaven at last. So let's pray now the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For 
and thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now if we come back to our reading in uh, Mark chapter 5, I want to look tonight at the next of our studies in the miracles of Jesus, uh, at this miracle by which Jesus uh, raised this dead child back to life, the daughter of Jairus, who was one of the rulers of the synagogue. And as you come to this particular miracle, it's one of three that we read in the Gospels that have to do with raising people from the dead. The three are this one here, there's one in Luke chapter 7, the son of a widow in the town of Nain. We don't know her name or the name of her son, but he had not long died and he was actually being carried along to the place where he was going to be buried. And the third one is in John chapter 20, probably the best known one, which is the raising of Lazarus. When Jesus called him, uh, the body of Lazarus had been in the tomb for four days, you remember, and he called him out from the dead and Lazarus came out of the tomb. And there's an, there's an interesting feature to those three when you compare them, because this one here we're looking at tonight is someone who's just newly dead. The one in Luke chapter 7 has been dead for a little while, they're on the way to bury him, and Lazarus was dead for four days. But it makes absolutely no difference to Jesus. It didn't make any difference that Lazarus was four days dead. For Jesus, it was as easy to bring ba Lazarus back from the dead as it was this little girl who had just newly died. And the spiritual point that's made in that is that however long we've been dead spiritually, it makes no difference to Jesus in terms of bringing us to life spiritually, bringing us to know him and bringing us to have eternal life in our possession. Now that means, doesn't mean that uh, we should be complacent about things. Uh, if we've been for a long time or for a considerable time still without Jesus as our Saviour, what I've just said is not designed to make us complacent or you complacent, but it is so that you will never lose hope, that you will always realise that Jesus is capable of giving you life at a time of his choosing, however long it's been since you've come into the world. Hold on to that tonight. Hold on to that in terms of your circumstances in life as well, because Jesus is as able to change them instantly as also after a long time in them. And one of the things, again, that we see from this passage is just the sheer busyness of Christ's life in this world. It's so busy in this passage that you find him actually dealing with two people, one after another. In fact, the miracle of healing this woman who had a hemorrhage of blood for all these years, the miracle of healing her is, as it were, tucked into the miracle of raising this young girl from the dead. He had started on the way to Jairus's house then he met this woman who came after him and touched his garment. And then he continues with that journey to uh, the house of Jairus to deal with his great crisis in his house. And uh, the busyness of, of Christ's life really is a telling reminder to us that God came into this world not as a celebrity safely secured from the ordinary goings on in this world. God entered the crush of human life. He entered the daily clashes of human life. He entered into the busyness of human life, the traumas of human life, uh, the experiences of human life in the raw, if you like. Not living in a large mansion, shielded from most of the world, travelling in a limousine from here and there, having his own personal minders or bodyguards so that people couldn't approach him. Jesus was actually right in the middle of this crowd. Jesus was always in the middle of things because he had such a concern to help people, especially to help them spiritually. And as you study uh, this miracle of Jesus raising uh, the daughter of, of, of Jairus back from the dead tonight, we can see that, first of all, under the crisis which brought Jairus to Jesus by way just of an introduction. And then we'll look mainly tonight at the journey back to Jairus' home. 
The crisis, first of all, that brought him to Jesus, one of the rulers of the synagogue. We're told he was a ruler of the synagogue. He was one of the, the people that, um, uh, that, that was uh, important in arranging uh, the matters of the synagogue, the services and so on. And his name was Jairus. And he came and fell at the feet of Jesus and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come, lay your hands on her so that she may be well and live. That was his dilemma. That was his plight. That was his crisis in life. He had a 12-year-old daughter who was just on the verge of death. She was just that close to death. And he knew she was that close to death when he left home. It was a critical moment. It was something none of us ever wants to experience. Any of our children coming to be taken from us before the end of our own life. And it happens. And we want to remember those for whom that's been the case. It's one of the most difficult situations you can meet in life to have to come and bury your own child or your own children. And here's a man who's in that situation. Here's a man who goes to Jesus with that situation. And you know, sometimes that's really the effect that that situation has on people. Uh, when you have somebody who is desperately ill themselves or somebody belonging to them is ill themselves, very often that will give them to think more seriously about life if they haven't done it already and think about God and think about eternity and think about death and think about these really serious issues. It doesn't always happen. Charles Darwin, we're told, um, uh, went away from God. He'd been raised up in a Christian home, but his young daughter was ill and she died and Darwin says that from that moment he ceased to believe in God. Uh, he didn't want to believe in God any longer if that's what God's providence was going to provide for him. And sadly there are others like that. But this man brought the matter to Jesus. And you know, that is really, as I've said already many times over the past year, that's been our constant prayer that people will come, even if they've never thought much about God at all, that God will actually use this pandemic and the crisis of this pandemic to bring eternity near to them, to bring the reality to ourselves as well as Christians, to stop and just take stock of what eternity is about, of what it's going to be for us at the end of our life in this world, that we're going to go and meet God and that we're going to answer to God when the day of judgment comes, for everything we've done in this life, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5, whether good or bad, we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And especially we pray that God will make Jesus precious to us during this time of pandemic so that he will bless this difficult, difficult time. So that people like this man, Jairus, will go to Jesus and will implore Jesus as he did for mercy, for acceptance, for forgiveness, for life. That's the crisis that brought Jairus to Jesus. How has the pandemic affected yourself and myself? Has it brought us closer to God? Has it given us even more serious thoughts about eternity? Has it been something that has caused us to take stock of life, take stock of where we are in relation to eternity, how has it been with us in regard to the Bible? Uh, what's our view of the Bible? Has the pandemic made us read the Bible more? Has it brought us to pray more uh, by ourselves with God? Has it done all of that for us? Because that's really what we pray that God will use it for. So that's the crisis that brought this man to Jesus. And secondly, let's look more fully at the journey back to Jairus' home. Well, the first thing you notice there is the journey beginning. And the journey begins there at verse 24, and he went with him. And he went with him. What a wonderful short sentence. There is this man imploring Jesus. You can see how serious he is, how earnest he is. He's just desperate that Jesus would go with him and come and lay his hands as he sees it on his daughter for her healing. And he, Jesus went with him. These are lovely words, aren't they? They really just tell you how instantly Jesus uh, gave, gave answer to his prayer. How earnestly Jesus wanted to do this for him. How much he, he was uh, concerned to help this man in his predicament. 
and to work a miracle to that end is what he did. But what an encouragement this is to Jairus at this point. The journey begins instantly. There's no delay. Um, there's nothing, no gap between the prayer of Jairus and Jesus going with him. And you know, these words are words that uh, are so full of impact for ourselves as well. These words, and he went with him. Jesus being with us is really the key to a contented life. Uh, it doesn't mean that, life's going to, that, life, that life's going to be easy. That doesn't mean there won't be many challenges, many things that will cause us pain and hurt. But Jesus going with us is the key to life in a way that pleases God and is for our benefit at last. And even our benefit through life. Jesus went with him. You know, whatever you go in life, if you can take Jesus with you, then you have an easy conscience. You have a life that's got satisfaction at the heart of it. And if you're involved in something where you cannot take Jesus with you, where you know Jesus would not be happy in that environment if he were with you physically, where you know Christ uh, has not given his approval to that sort of environment, well, how can you live a life of satisfaction? How can you look forward to eternity with Jesus in heaven if you've not taken him with you and if you're not pleased to have him with you on the steps through life? Jesus went with him. You make sure, whatever is the case in your life, that Jesus is going with you, that you take Christ with you, that you keep him by your side, that you keep accessing him each and every day. So that's the, the journey beginning at that stage. Then you come to this second miracle, which we're not going to go into, and you pick up the reading again at verse 35. While he was still speaking, that's speaking to uh, this woman that he had just cured, while he was still speaking, news came from the ruler's house saying, your daughter is dead, why trouble the teacher any further? So the journey that's begun is very soon delayed. There's another person needing him. This woman has needed him, so he actually halts and deals with this woman. And as he deals with this woman, just try as much as we can to picture or to just get a feel for Jairus's mind. What would Jairus have been thinking when the Lord stopped before restarting the journey again to deal with this woman? Jairus would have been thinking something like, I'm sure, what is he stopping here for with this woman? This is not a fatal disease. The woman's not going to die if he leaves her just now and goes on his way with me to my daughter is at the point of death. Why is he doing this? And yet Jesus does. He stops there. He deals with this woman. Just imagine if you were uh, receiving, if you're away from home, some miles away from home, you receive news that your loved one, a child, let's say, is taken to hospital with a serious illness and is, appears to be in the process of end stage of life. Imagine you set out to get to the hospital and you run into a roadblock because the road has been blocked for some reason. There's no way around from where you are. The police come and say, I'm sorry, the road's going to be closed for the next three or four hours at least. What's going through your mind when you want to get to that person? You want to get to where your, your loved one is desperately ill and at the point of death. That's how it was for this man. Just imagine what he's, what he's thinking as Jesus suddenly stops and starts dealing with this woman on the journey to Jairus' house. So the journey is delayed. You know, but it makes no difference at the end of the day to Jesus. That's one of the points of the whole story. Here's this delay, and as far as this man is concerned, I'm sure he's thinking, well, my daughter's going to be dead before we get home, so what's the point? It's not going to make any difference whatsoever. Jesus is going to show, as he did with Lazarus, however long someone's been dead makes no difference. He has the power to overcome that situation. So the journey sometimes for us too is delayed. Spiritually, we may not yet be hearing an answer to our prayer, but the Lord knows what he's doing. And in his own good time, he will take us further on in the journey. So the journey begins. The journey is delayed. Let's move on. The journey 
seems pointless because now you find the news coming from his house. Some of his servants came and said, your daughter is dead. Why do you trouble the teacher any further? In other words, they're really saying, look, there's no point, master. There's no point in going any further. Your daughter has died. Don't, don't trouble Jesus anymore. He can't come now and lay his hand on her because she's dead. It's too late. No point in going any further. And I just love the way that Jesus instantly speaks into that situation before you might say before the 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 the, uh, the ruler before Jairus can even get a thought into his mind that accepts what he's just heard about it being a pointless journey now Jesus comes and says don't be afraid only believe fabulous instant Jesus comes into the situation and says to him doesn't matter what you've heard. Even if she is dead, as they're saying, as she is, don't you be afraid. All you have to do is believe. You just believe. You just trust in me. How telling these words are for ourselves. When you trust in Christ, when you take him into your life as he offers himself in the gospel, when you go on trusting in him through life, all things will ultimately turn out well for you. As Horatius Spafford said, having lost so many of his family at sea in the Atlantic, it is well, it is well with my soul. That was his conclusion. And that's what Jesus is saying to this man. Don't be afraid, don't fear, only believe. And for you tonight and for me tonight, you know, sometimes we may be thinking that the journey has become somewhat weary and somewhat pointless even. And that things have happened that cause us perhaps to doubt the sincerity of the Bible or of Jesus himself. These are thoughts that come to us all from time to time. But remember this, the one who masters death will take care of all issues in life. If he can raise the dead as he did and as he can, then he's going to take care of your life, whatever things are in it, whatever delays might be in it, whatever disappointments might be in it, whatever things in your life will bewilder you and will cause you to actually ask serious questions, even of God himself. The one who masters death, the Jesus who's in charge of death, the Jesus who can take death by the scruff of the neck and say, I'm your master. Not too much for him to look after your life and my life and the things of your life as you go through this world and it's interesting too at this stage that he allowed no one else to follow him from now on to Jairus's house but Peter and James and John the brother of James that's an interesting point uh, and in fact it's interesting because when you see Jesus taking these three disciples with him in other circumstances, for example, on the Mount of Transfiguration, they were the three. In the Garden of Gethsemane, a very different environment to the Mount of Transfiguration, these are the three that he took into the furthest reaches of the Garden. And in each of these instances, like there is here, death features somewhere in these episodes. On the Mount of Transfiguration, uh, the Jesus who was there shining the glory that came from him, but the conversation between himself and Moses and Elijah was his exodus, his decease, his going out of the world, his death followed by resurrection and then ascension. They were talking about his exodus. They were talking about his leaving this world. In other words, they were including his death, the thing that he had come into this world to do. And of course, in Gethsemane, very obvious as you read that passage in the Gospels, that death is overwhelmingly on the mind of Jesus. He then began, says Mark, to be so amazed, his soul filled with sorrow, as that death of the cross was nearer than ever before, and as the weight of it was more than ever before upon his soul. There is Peter and James and John with him in the Garden of Gethsemane. And here they are here. Why is that? Well, it's to educate them, surely. They're going to be educated 
about how Jesus deals with death. About death and the experience of and ministry of Jesus himself. And here about Christ's uh, control and mastery of death in respect to the raising of people back to life. And of course that means spiritually as well as physically as it was for this girl. Because all of these events have a spiritual meaning attached to them. And so here is an education process for Peter and James and John. An education by which they're led further into an understanding of Christ's relationship with death. For himself and for his people. And that's where they come now to the journey's end. The journey begins. The journey was delayed. The journey continued. And now the journey is at an end when they reached Peter and James and John and himself. They came to Jairus' house and they saw a commotion there, people weeping. And of course, in those days, it was very common to have people hired uh, to engage in wailing and lament, lamenting when somebody died. There were professional people that actually did this all the time. And then verse 39, we find when he had entered, he said to them, why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. Now we mustn't take from that that she wasn't really dead, that she was just in a coma. Some people take that view of it, but that's not the case. In John chapter 11, with the death of Lazarus, you find Jesus saying something similar, something almost identical to that. He had said to his disciples that Lazarus had fallen asleep, and the disciples said, well, he's done well if he's fallen asleep. He will recover and Jesus had spoken of his death and then Jesus told them plainly Lazarus has died and for your sake I'm glad that I wasn't there so sleeping here in this context and other context is not um, it's not a word that's used it's not a description of being in a state of unconsciousness of coma this girl had died her life in this world had ended she had fallen asleep, as far as Jesus was concerned. So when he said that she was just sleeping, they laughed at him. Now that's a proof again that she had actually died. They weren't going to laugh at him if she had not actually died, if they hadn't come to the point where they were convinced this girl is dead. This girl is dead. What's he saying? That she's only sleeping. So they laughed at him. And of course he put them out. And then he took the disciples and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. And I don't know if you've ever gone into a room where the body of someone who's died is laid out. There's a tremendous stillness there. And you respect that stillness. The commotion is now outside of this room. He's put all these people who are making such a noise and a fuss outside. And they come into this room where the child, this 12-year-old girl, is lying prostrate and dead, stillness, a hush. And Jesus goes and takes her by the hand and says at the same time, Talitha kumi, which we're told in Mark's Gospel here, little girl I say to you, arise. He took her by the hand so that in reaching out and touching her and taking her hand, they would see that Jesus was identifying with this girl, not only identifying with her as someone who had just died, but identifying with her with his great concern that she be brought back to life. But you know, these words that he used, and it's Mark that records them here in the Aramaic language that he would have used, they are actually words that her mother would have used probably every morning or most mornings when she came to wake and I think that's such a beautiful touch because it really amounts to Jesus coming in taking this young girl who was dead by the hand and saying time to wake up my darling time to wake up don't you see the heart of Jesus in that don't you see the love of Jesus in that? Don't you see the understanding of Jesus in that? Don't you see the compassion of Jesus in that? Don't you see Jesus identifying not with, not simply with this girl who is dead, but with her parents, with her sense of loss? Don't you see in every respect of this 
how Jesus is so fully involved in the event that's just happened and is so concerned to make it better for them. Time to get up, my darling, my little one. And immediately the girl got up and began walking. She was about 12 years of age and they were immediately overcome with amazement. Now that really shows us, as you read this, that the effect of Jesus' voice, Jesus' speaking, was creative. It brought the dead back to life. She immediately began walking. In other words, she was back to normal. She was a 12-year-old walking as she had been just before she died, or shortly before she, certainly before she became ill. It's normality, you see, after Christ blesses your life. It's things as they should be. Everything's back in place. Your relationship with God is fixed. Your uh, approach to eternity has changed. Your relationship with death has changed. The moment Jesus speaks his words creatively into your life, into your soul, everything changes. Just like Ellie Holcomb's song, everything's changed. The moment you stepped out of that grave, everything changed, she said. Of course, everything changed then, but it's for the benefit of people like you and I, so that everything will change for us too. The Jesus who rose from the dead is the Jesus who raises the dead. That's what he's demonstrating in these wonderful, poignant, emotional words. These, the words really of the home, the words of the mother, the words of love. Darling, it's time to get up. It's time for you to get on your feet. And she began walking. You see, that's another point that's made by this. As he charged them that no one should know this, why, why did he do that? Well, because Jesus knew very well that people like those who were making a commotion outside would, would just want to make something of a circus of this. A really dramatic moment and just take that out into the community and uh, make a fuss of it and make a misuse of it, a complicate life further for them. And you wouldn't have that. Miracles were not for that. Miracles were not for the dramatic, though they were dramatic. Miracles were not even simply to compel faith on the part of those who saw them. They didn't always do that anyway. Never lose sight of this. That miracles, this one and most if not all of the others, were to alleviate the plight, plight of human beings in their distress. Jesus took delight in doing this, not just to show how powerful he was, not just so that people would say about him, isn't he an amazing person, but so that people would realise this is God in action. And this is God in having come to seek and to save that which was lost. And you notice then he said, give her something to eat. How like Jesus that is. As if just to prove beyond any doubt that she is in fact back to life in the proper normal way, a proof of being alive, but also a proof of his, of his thoughtfulness. Go on, give her something to eat. Just back in the normal routine of life. That's the Jesus who restores us from the dead so that we come to enjoy life in its fullness. Now, in closing, I want to take you back to Matthew's Gospel. Because Matthew, in his account of the same incident, uh, you find it in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 24. And sometimes these little additional features as you compare the Gospels are actually quite telling. Matthew chapter 9 and uh, at verse 24, where you find Jesus coming to the house and seeing the crowd and the noise and the, and the, the commotion that's there. He said, go away, for the girl is not dead but sleeping. And these words that have been translated there, go away, the older translations have give place. And they literally, you could translate that, make space. Here is Jesus arriving at this door and he has all of this in front of him, this commotion, this crowd, and what he's saying to them, make space, make space for me, let us in, let us through. 
And tonight these words are for you and for me. Even if you've been a Christian, as I have myself for many years, there are certain times when things, when things crowd around the door of your heart and Jesus has to come and say, make space for me. Let me through. Put these things aside. Put me back in prior place. And if you're not yet a Christian, if you're not yet saved, if you haven't yet accepted Jesus, and now is the time really to do this, if you've not done it before. But listen to what Jesus is saying to you tonight. To all the things in your life, the anxieties, the questions, the prejudices, all the things that crowd around the door of your heart and are keeping Jesus out, he is saying, give me space. Give me space in your life. Let me in. Let me take control. And life will be far better for you. And God bless these thoughts to us. Let us pray. Lord our God, teach us daily, we pray, to give you space in our hearts. Not only space, but the chief space. Uh, in our experiences, in all that we seek to, to be and to do day by day. Lord our God, we thank you for your word. And that brings us to consider those matters of chief importance that we so often, O oh Lord, too often place below the things of this present world. Hear us and accept our worship this evening. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Now we're going to conclude our service tonight by singing once again. Our singing from Sing Psalms this time, Psalm 116. In Sing Psalms, that's page 154. And we'll soon sing to a tune, Eventide. I love the Lord because he heard my voice. He listened when I cried to him for aid. I'll call on him as long as I shall live because he turned to hear me when I prayed. Verses uh, marked 1 to 9 uh, on, in Psalm 116. I love the Lord because he heard my voice. He listened when I cried to him for it. I'll call on him as long as I shall live, because he turned to hear me when I prayed. The cords of death gripped and entangled me. Upon me came the anguish of the grave. With grief and trouble I was overcome. Then on the name of God I called Lord, save. The Lord our God is kind and full of grace. O oh, righteous and compassionate is he. The Lord protects all those of childlike faith. When I was in great need, he rescued me. Rest, O oh my soul, God has been good to you. For you, O oh Lord, have saved my soul from death. My feet from stumbling and my eyes from tears, that I may love for you while I have breath. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and evermore. Amen. <clears throat>
Thank you once again sincerely for joining us. It's a great encouragement as always uh, to have your company for this time of worship. Now, I'm going to be on a short break for a week from tomorrow till the following Monday. Uh, so it'll be Kenny's turn anyway for the Wednesday evening midweek. And uh, next Lord's Day, uh, Kenny will be uh, accompanied and helped by Scott McLeod who will be taking one of the services for next Lord's Day. Meantime, please uh, do keep safe and may you know God's blessing over these days ahead. Thank you.